Recordings, raids, and seizures. Olivia, Junior and Peter's agreement with the feds was basically unheard of in the history of U.S. drug trafficking investigations. They'd tape all their conversations and phone calls, gather information and intelligence, facilitate massive seizures of drugs and money, and secure indictments and extraditions of the United States and Mexico's highest-ranking cartel members. If their workers unloaded a shipment of drugs in Chicago and Peter was on the line to supervise it, it went on tape. If Peter arranged distribution to the wholesalers, it was recorded. If Junior negotiated prices for their loads, the DEA and U.S. attorneys were going to hear it. Mia, who everyone really hoped to get, though, were the leaders of the Sinaloa cartel and the BLO. In 2008, there wasn't much direct criminal evidence against El Chapo, El Mayo, Alfredo Beltran, or any other member of the two cartels. Sure, there was a trail of clues that may or may not have led back to them, and a pile of bodies building up on either side of the cartel wars, but no one had the leaders on tape. In fact, there weren't any recent photos of Chapo, and even his appearance remained a mystery to the U.S. authorities. In order to get an indictment against him, they needed solid evidence that would prove that the heads of the Sinaloa cartel were actually involved in drug conspiracy in the United States and especially in Chicago. That's what they were counting on Peter and Junior for. Olivia. In exchange for all the information Junior and Peter gathered and turned in, they'd receive leniency when it came to their crimes. But as with everything involved in their cooperation, there were no promises. They might get five years, or they might get 30. In fact... The specifics weren't even discussed during their conversations with the lawyers or the agents. They couldn't be because the ultimate sentencing decision, which might not happen for years, was up to a federal judge. Mia. The guidance they received about recording was just as unclear. If you think the feds came into our houses and put secret cameras in our walls or microphones in our ink pens like in a James Bond movie, you're dead wrong. Peter and Junior had the opportunity to unravel the entire North American drug trade, but they didn't even have the necessary equipment. They had to buy their own recorders at places like Radio Shack. They'd fill up a few recorders a week, upload the conversations onto USB drives, then hand them over to the agents. Worse than that, the government couldn't be responsible for their lives, so they wouldn't advise them on what they were supposed to say when they recorded. Everything they did or said was at their own risk. Olivia Junior and Peter worked with the DEA's and U.S. Attorney's offices in Chicago. All information came from Chicago, and all reporting went back to them. There were government officials, such as the DEA, FBI, U.S. Marshals, and Homeland Security stationed in Guadalajara, but those agents had no jurisdiction in Mexico, so they were powerless. The cartels could run right over them if they wanted to. In fact, it seemed like anyone might be able to. In our part of Guadalajara, we used to see them around, just out and about like sitting ducks. They weren't hard to miss. They looked like American tourists and drove around in cars with diplomat plates. One used to work out at Junior's gym, and when Junior would walk in, he'd just smile and nod at him. There was no reason to be scared. Junior was protected by the cartels, and there was nothing some random fed could do about it. Hmm. On a few occasions after they started cooperating, Junior and Peter were debriefed and questioned at random hotels or hidden side streets. But the agents just fed information up the pipeline to Chicago. They'd tell Peter and Junior what was happening in Mexico, though. One time, they revealed to my husband and brother-in-law that an informant had just been killed. Believe me, that scared the shit out of all of us. Mia. Another big problem was that the Chicago office was making things up as they went along. 
Or at least that's how we felt. I bet they were. There had been cartel bosses that had cooperated in the past, but after the fact, once they were captured and sent to prison, there hadn't been any on the streets and in the mountains federal informants on Peter and Junior's scale in anyone's lifetime, and especially not ratting out the heads of the cartels. Our husbands had reached the peak of the drug trade, and because of that, the DEA's office had no idea what kind of information they'd be getting from them. It wasn't like they could prepare Junior and Peter, or even guide them. Olivia Even as anxious and unsatisfied as they were, Junior and Peter felt a huge sense of responsibility when it came to the agents they were working with. Undercover agents stationed in Guadalajara were putting their lives in our husband's hands, and if the cartels found out who they were, they'd be executed on the spot. Think about that. These guys are sitting here trying to trying to survive this whole this whole war between these cartels. The United States government is doing nothing to protect them in the sense of helping them do this and none of this, but they're worried about putting agents in dangerous situations, agents that are supposed to be there to help them. Because of that, Junior and Peter were amazed at the degree of bravery and integrity these guys possessed. They were doing the right things for the right reasons. And by ensuring their safety, our husbands were finding hidden depths in their own integrity. Mia Peter got hundreds and hundreds of phone calls on his burner phones every day, and he recorded each one. He figured it would just be easier to stay home, where he always had his recording devices set up, and could use his two-way earbud in private. Outside, it was much more dangerous. What if he was out on the street, got a call, and had to put his earbud in and turn the recorder on? Yeah, Somebody would see that, and he'd be dead. At home, he kept his earpiece in when he was on calls, or if people were around, he'd take it out and hide it. He stashed it in drawers, next to the TV, or anywhere else that no one could see. Even though the government told him explicitly not to record in person, he had to sometimes. I remember him hiding the cord in the back of a book, with the bud sticking out from the pages. When he met with people in his office, he'd try to position himself as close as possible to the bookshelf, with them sitting nearby so he could be sure every word they said got on tape. The whole thing made me a nervous wreck, and I did everything I could to make his days better. Let that was a full-on undercover situation. They was basically the coldest undercover cops that ever existed at that point. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's what they were. Deep undercover, with no help, off the books type shit. That's stressful. Then, anytime anyone came over, I'd spend half an hour running around making sure the recorders were hidden. After they'd arrive, I'd try to figure out what to do with myself. I'd tell Peter, I don't know what to do when people are here and you're recording. What if they can read my face and body language and know I'm hiding something? Relax, Peter would say. Just try not to be around. So I'd go in the other room and pretend to be busy, all the time worrying that the battery on the recorder would run down and start beeping. I just didn't want us to die. It was as simple as that. I didn't want to be tortured or have my baby gutted out of me. Yeah, I'm sure you didn't. That sounds, that sounds rather reasonable. And I knew that was a real possibility if we got caught. Olivia. Many of the calls Peter and Junior made were to their associates in Chicago, making sure that the shipments were arriving where they needed to be on time. They had to keep their business moving along, yet no one could know they were undercover. So they were constantly hitting the feds with information like, there's a load in L.A., or there's a stash house in this neighborhood in Chicago. Then the feds would swoop in and bust those locations, seizing the drugs up. and arrest. They had to do nothing else. All they had to do was show up. They got all the information handed right to them. All they had to do was show up. And you would think they, they'd walk around less cocky. They act like they did it all. Then the feds would swoop in and bust those locations, seizing the drugs and arresting everyone. Little by little, everyone they were working with in the United States was going to get hauled in. Mia. 
The first seizure was one of the most stressful things they'd ever been through. On August 9, 2008, Junior and Peter were expecting a load from a line they'd been working in Mexicali. This shipment in particular was 250 kilos, which was about the norm. The load had made its way through a network of tunnels, crossed the border, was placed on tractor trailers, and was en route to Chicago with a precise pickup time of 6 a.m. Saturday. As always, Junior and Peter had done a dry run before the shipment hit the road, so everything was running like clockwork. They had the fastest routes picked out and knew the best ways to avoid taking too many streets. They'd planned to stick to highways and busy roads so that the trucks would just blend in. Olivia Peter had given the feds the exact address of the warehouse in Melrose Park, outside of Chicago, walking them through the location using Google Earth so they knew exactly where to park without anyone noticing them. The night before, Eric and Matt went there and staked the place out. Then, they set up an undercover DEA agent to receive the load, called a controlled delivery, explaining to their workers that there was this new guy there for pickup. Hmm. Peter called the coordinator who was in charge of the shipment to Chicago and started speaking in code. Is Pancho there? He asked in Spanish. On behalf of whom? Asked the coordinator. On behalf of Donald Trump. He'd cracked the combination. Things were ready to move. Mia. After he hung up, Peter was a wreck. We had this little white Maltese named Gigi, who was his baby. That dog followed him everywhere, and I swear if he had to choose between me or the dog, he would have chosen her, for sure. The entire night before the raid, Peter kept walking back and forth to his computer, checking Google Earth to see which streets the agents could park on. Gigi hung right at his heels, her tiny pink-painted toenails clacking on the floor. As I struggled to fall asleep that night, thinking about the choices he and Junior had made and how exhausted Peter was by this life, all I could hear were those toenails back and forth on the hardwood. Olivia. The next morning, the workers were in place, ready to receive the load. The feds were on the ground, and Peter, Junior, Mia, and I were up bright and early, stationed near the phone. Eric finally called. The truck just pulled in. We're ready to go. Hours later, when Eric rang and said that they'd taken down the truck and confiscated the kilos, Peter called Olivares, Chapo's right-hand man, to let him know that the load had been caught. Well, whatever, Olivares said. Bro, that's a dangerous game. You, you, getting them, you getting those loads caught, and you gotta hit up Buddy whose load it is and tell them they got caught. It's crazy. And when they got seized, they lost the 10% that they'd paid up front. Junior and Peter personally paid back $5 million on their first seizure alone. And at the same time, their workers and associates in Chicago, L.A., and every other city where they did business were getting arrested. These were people they'd known all their lives, mm -hmm. men and women they loved. They felt guilty. We I all did. Should have. There was danger on every corner, too. Not just to them and to us, but to everyone they were even remotely connected to. After they repaid Olivares for a seized 250-kilo shipment, he confronted Junior and Peter because too many loads were falling, one after another. That's why I blame the government. You, you, you didn't protect them. All you had to do was let them keep their operation going. They had been making money for how many years already? And you worried about one more year of them making money? You could come back for that bread later. You just don't want to get caught in public with your pants down with, with drug dealers working for you because that's what y'all did before with the Contras. All they had to do was let them keep working. Now they got them they got them giving up the shipment, giving up the money, and then paying off the debt to the cartel boss out of pocket. You know what I'm saying? You're putting them under mad heat. You want this case or you want them all done for and out of there? That's the choices that they were at. And the U.S. was like, I don't know, whatever. Whatever whatever happens first, whatever works. Like, y'all tweaked. You should have just let them work business as usual. You would have got everything you needed. I think it was the trucker who ratted you out. It was his first run. We don't know him. And it's suspicious that the feds let him go. 
Peter said, no, no, I checked him out. He's not a snitch. Peter and Junior kept arguing and eventually saved the driver's life, but it planted a particular kind of terror in their minds. Even with just the smallest bit of suspicion from the cartels, with just the tiniest shred of doubt about their honesty, the cartels wouldn't hesitate to have them killed. It's going down. These boys is on the wire already. They're hung out to dry. And they're doing it all on their own with their wives. And that's pretty much it right there. They're feeling the guilt, feeling the pressure, uh, feeling the stress, all of the above. More of the pressure cooker that they've been in since they've been in the game. Very tense situation. They out there on their own playing undercover. And uh, every single minute their life is on the line, every word they say, all it takes is one of those bosses to just wake up on the wrong side of the bed for them to say, you know what, these guys ain't on the level lately. 